The Fox and the Stork by Flora J. Cook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A fox met a stork and invited him to dinner. With all my heart, friend, said the stork. When they arrived at the home of the fox and dinner was served, he was not so happy. The fox had a fine hot soup, but he served it in shallow plates. The poor stork could only stand by and watch the fox eat. The fox seemed to think that it was a very good joke. The next day, the stork met the fox and invited him to dinner. The stork brought out fine hot soup in a high narrow necked bottle, but the fox could not see the joke at all. The stork said, Friend fox, enjoy your dinner. I hope the soup is as well flavored as yours was yesterday. As he said this, he poured out half of the soup into a bowl and set it before the fox. The cunning old fox felt so ashamed that he has never looked anyone straight in the face since that day. End of The Fox and the Stork by Flora J. Cook Good Luck is Better Than Gold by Juliana Horatia Ewing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was, once upon a time, a child who had good luck for his godfather. I am not fortune, said good luck to the parents. I have no gifts to bestow, but whenever he needs help, I will be at hand. Nothing could be better, said the old couple. They were delighted. But what pleases the father often fails to satisfy the son. Moreover, every man thinks that he deserves just a little more than he has got and does not reckon it to the purpose if his father had less. Many a one would be thankful to have as good reasons for contentment as he who had good luck for his godfather. If he fell, good luck popped something soft in the way to break his fall. If he fought, good luck directed his blows or tripped up his adversary. If he got into a scrape, good luck helped him out of it. And if ever misfortune met him, good luck contrived to hustle her on the pathway till his godson got safely by. In games of hazard, the godfather played over his shoulder. In matters of choice, he chose for him. And when the lad began to work on his father's farm, the farmer began to get rich. For no bird or field mouse touched a seed that his son had sown, and every plant he planted throve when good luck smiled on it. The boy was not fond of work, but when he did go into the fields, good luck followed him. Your christening day was a blessed day for us all, said the old farmer. He's never given me so much as a lucky sixpence, muttered Good Luck's godson. I'm not fortune, I make no presents, said the godfather. When we are discontented, it is oftener to please our neighbors than ourselves. It was because the other boys had said, Simon, the shoemaker's son, had an alderman for his godfather. He gave him a silver spoon with the apostle Peter for the handle but thy godfather is more powerful than any alderman. The good luck's godson complained, he has never given me so much as a bent sixpence. By and by, the old farmer died, and his son grew up and had the largest farm in the country. The other boys grew up also, and as they looked over the farmer's boundary wall, they would say, Good morning, neighbor. That is certainly a fine farm of yours. Your cattle thrive without loss. Your crops grow in the rain and are reaped with the sunshine. Mischance never comes your road. What you have worked for, you enjoy. Such success would turn the heads of poor folk like us. At the same time, one would think a man need hardly work for his living at all, who has good luck for his godfather. That is very true, thought the farmer. Many a man is prosperous and reaps what he sows, who had no more than the clerk and the sexton for gossips at his christening. What's the matter, godson? asked good luck, who was with him in the field. I want to be rich, said the farmer. You will not have to wait long, replied the godfather. In every field you sow, in every flock you rear, there is increase without abatement. Your wealth is already tenfold greater than your father's. Aye, aye, replied the farmer. Good wages for good work. 
but many a young man has gold at his command who need never turn a sod, and none of the good people come to his christening. Fortunatus's purse now, or even a sack or two of gold. Peace, cried the godfather, I have said that I give no gifts. Though he had not Fortunatus's purse, the farmer had now money and to spare, and when the harvest was gathered in, he bought a fine suit of clothes and took his best horse and went to the royal city to see the sights. The pomp and the splendor, the festivities and fine clothes dazzled him. This is a gay life which these young courtiers lead, said he. A man has nothing to do but to enjoy himself. If he has plenty of gold in his pocket, said a bystander. By and by, the princess passed in her carriage. She was the king's only daughter. She had hair made of sunshine, and her eyes were stars. What an exquisite creature, cried the farmer. What would not one give to possess her? She has as many suitors as hairs on her head, replied the bystander. She wants to marry the Prince of Moonshine, but he only dresses in silver, and the king thinks he might find a richer son-in-law. The princess will go to the highest bidder. And I have good luck for my godfather, and am not even at court, cried the farmer, and he put spurs to his horse and rode home. Good luck was taking care of the farm. Listen, godfather, cried the young man, I'm in love with the king's daughter, and I want her to wife. It is not an easy matter, replied good luck, but I will do what I can for you. Say that by good luck you saved the princess's life, or perhaps better the king's for they say he is selfish. Tush, cried the farmer, the king is covetous and wants a rich son-in-law. A wise man may bring wealth to a kingdom with his head, if not with his hands, said Goodluck, and I can show you a district where the earth only wants mining to be flooded with wealth. Besides, there are a thousand opportunities that can be turned to account and influence, by wits and work and with good luck to help him, many a poorer man than you has risen to greatness. Wits and work, cried the indignant godson. You speak well, truly. A hillman would have made a better godfather. Give me as much gold as will fill three meal bins, and you may keep the rest of your help for those who want it. Now at this moment, by good luck, stood Dame Fortune. She likes handsome young men, and there was some little jealousy between her and the godfather, so she smiled at the quarrel. You would rather have had me for your gossip, said she. If you would give me three wishes, I would, replied the farmer boldly, and I would trouble you no more. Will you make him over to me? said Dame Fortune to the godfather. If he wishes it, replied Good Luck, but if he accepts your gifts, he has no further claim on me. Nor on me either, said the dame. Hark ye, young man, you mortals are apt to make a hobble of your three wishes, and you may end with a sausage at your nose like your betters. I've thought of it often, replied the farmer, and I know what I want. For my first wish, I desire imperishable beauty. It is yours, said Dame Fortune, smiling as she looked at him. The face of a prince and the manners of a clown are poor partners, said the farmer. My second wish is for suitable learning and courtly manners, which cannot be gained at the plow tail. You have them in perfection, said the dame, and the young man thanked her with a graceful bow. Thirdly, said he, I demand a store of gold that I can never exhaust. I will lead you to it, said Dame Fortune, and the young man was so eager to follow her that he did not even look back to bid farewell to his godfather. He was soon at court. He lived in the utmost pomp. He had a suit of armor made for himself out of beaten gold. No metal less precious might come near his person, except for the blade of his sword. This was obliged to be made of steel, for gold is not always strong enough to defend one's life or his honor. But the princess still loved the Prince of Moonshine. Stuff and nonsense, said the king, I shall give you to the Prince of Gold. I wish I had the good luck to please her, muttered the young prince, but he had not, for all his beauty and his wealth. However, she was to marry him, and that was something. The preparations for the wedding were magnificent. It is a great expense, sighed the king, but then I get the Prince of Gold for a son-in-law. The prince and his bride drove round the city in a triumphal procession. Her hair fell over her like sunshine, but the starlight of her eyes was cold. In the train rode the Prince of Moonshine, dressed in silver, but with no color in his face. 
As the bridal chariot approached one of the city gates, two black ravens hovered over it and then flew away and settled on a tree. Good Luck was sitting under the tree to see his godson's triumph, and he heard the birds talking above him. Has the Prince of Gold no friend who can tell him that there's a loose stone above the archway that is tottering to fall, said they, and Good Luck covered his face with his mantle as the prince drove through. Just as they were passing out of the gateway, the stone fell onto the prince's head. He wore a cask of pure gold, but his neck was broken. We can't have all this expense for nothing, said the king, so he married his daughter to the Prince of Moonshine. If one can't get gold, one must be content with silver. Will you come to the funeral? asked Dame Fortune of the godfather. Not I, replied Good Luck. I had no hand in this matter. The rain came down in torrents. The black feathers on the raven's backs looked as if they had been oiled. Call, call, said they. It was an unlucky end. However, the funeral was a very magnificent one, for there was no stint of gold. End of Good Luck is Better Than Gold by Juliana Horatia Ewing Read by Colleen McMahon The Little Red Hen by Florence White Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Little Red Hen Lived in a Barnyard she spent almost all of her time walking about the barnyard in her pickety peckety fashion, scratching everywhere for worms. She dearly loved fat, delicious worms and felt they were absolutely necessary to the health of her children. As often as she found a worm, she would call chuck, chuck, chuck to her chickies. When they were gathered about her, she would distribute choice morsels of her tidbit. A busy little body was she, a cat usually napped lazily in the barn door, not even bothering herself to scare the rat who ran here and there as he pleased. And as for the pig who lived in the sty, he did not care what happened, so long as he could eat and grow fat. One day, the little red hen found a seed. It was a wheat seed, but the little red hen was so accustomed to bugs and worms that she supposed this to be some new and perhaps very delicious kind of meat. She bit it gently and found that it resembled a worm, in no way whatsoever as to taste, although because it was long and slender, a little red hen might easily be fooled by its appearance. Carrying it about, she made many inquiries as to what it might be. She found it was a wheat seed and that, if planted, it would grow up and when ripe, it could be made into flour and then into bread. When she discovered that, she knew it ought to be planted. She was so busy hunting food for herself and her family that naturally she thought she ought not to take time to plant it. So she thought of the pig, upon whom time must hang heavily, and of the cat who had nothing to do, and of the great fat rat with his idle hours, she called loudly, Who will plant the seed? But the pig said, Not I, and the cat said, Not I, and the rat said, Not I. Well then, said the little red hen, I will. And she did. Then she went on with her daily duties through the long summer days, scratching for worms and feeding her chicks, while the pig grew fat, and the cat grew fat, and the rat grew fat and the wheat grew tall and ready for harvest. So one day, the little red hen chanced to notice how large the wheat was and that the grain was ripe, so she ran about calling briskly, Who will cut the wheat? The pig said, Not I. The cat said, Not I. And the rat said, Not I. Well then, said the little red hen, I will. And she did. She got the sickle from among the farmer's tools in the barn and proceeded to cut off all of the big plant of wheat. On the ground lay the nicely cut wheat, ready to be gathered and threshed. But the newest and yellowest and downest of Mrs. 
Hence, chicks set up a peep peep peeping in their most vigorous fashion, proclaiming to the world at large, but mostly particularly to their mother, that she was neglecting them. Poor little red hen. She felt quite bewildered and hardly knew where to turn. Her attention was sorely divided between her duty to her children and her duty to the wheat, for which she felt responsible. So again, in a very hopeful tone, she called out, Who will thresh the wheat? But the pig with a grunt said, Not I. And the cat with a meow said, Not I. And the rat with a squeak said, Not I. So the little red hen, looking, it must be admitted, rather discouraged, said, Well, I will then. And she did. Of course, she had to feed her babies first, though, and when she had gotten them all to sleep for their afternoon nap, she went out and threshed the wheat. Then she called out, who will carry the wheat to the mill to be ground? Turning their backs with snippy glee, that pig said, not I, and that cat said, not I, and that rat said, not I. So the good little red hen could do nothing but say, I will then, and she did. Carrying the sack of wheat, she trudged off to the distant mill. There she ordered the wheat ground into beautiful white flour. When the miller brought her the flour, she walked slowly back all the way to her own barnyard in her own pickety-peckety fashion. She even managed, in spite of her load, to catch a nice juicy worm now and then, and had one left for the babies when she reached them. Those cunning little fluffballs were so glad to see their mother. For the first time, they really appreciated her. After this really strenuous day, Mrs. Hen retired to her slumbers earlier than usual. Indeed, before the colors came into the sky to hurl the setting of the sun, her usual bedtime hour. She would have liked to sleep late in the morning, but her chicks, joining in the morning chorus of the hen yard, drove away all hopes of such a luxury. Even as she sleepily half opened one eye, the thought came to her that today that wheat must somehow be made into bread. She was not in the habit of making bread, although of course anyone can make it if he or she follows the recipe with care and she knew perfectly well that she could do it if necessary. So after her children were fed and made sweet and fresh for the day, she hunted up the pig, the cat, and the rat. Still confident that they would surely help her some day, she sang out, Who will make the bread? Alas, for the little red hen, once more her hopes were dashed, for the pig said, Not I. The cat said, Not I. And the rat said, not I. So the little red hen said once more, I will then, and she did. Feeling that she might have known all the time that she would have to do it all herself, she went and put on a fresh apron and spotless cook's cap. First of all, she set the dough as was proper. When it was time, she brought out the molding board and the baking tins, molded the bread, divided it into loaves and put them into the oven to bake. All the while, the cat sat lazily by, giggling and chuckling. And close at hand, the vain rat powdered his nose and admired himself in a mirror. In the distance could be heard the long, drawn snores of the dozing pig. At last, the great moment arrived. A delicious odor was wafted upon the autumn breeze, Everywhere the barnyard citizens sniffed the air with delight. The red hen ambled in her pickety peckety way toward the source of all this excitement. Although she appeared to be perfectly calm, in reality she could only with difficulty restrain an impulse to dance and sing, for had she not done all the work on this wonderful bread? Small wonder that she was the most excited person in the barnyard. She did not know whether the bread would be fit to eat. But joy of joys, when the lovely brown loaves came out of the oven, they were done to perfection. Then, probably because she had acquired the habit, the red hen called, 
who will eat the bread all the animals in the barnyard were watching hungrily and smacking their lips in anticipation and the pig said i will the cat said i will the rat said i will but the little red hen said no you won't i will and she did end of the little red hen by florence white williams the quangle wangles hat by edward lear this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on the top of the crumpety tree the quangle wangle sat but his face you could not see on account of his beaver hat for his hat was a hundred and two feet wide with ribbons and bibbons on every side and bells and buttons and loops and lace so that nobody ever could see the face of the quangle wangle quee the quangle wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree jam and jelly and bread are the best of food for me but the longer i live on this crumpety tree the plainer than ever it seems to me that very few people come this way and that life on the whole is far from gay said the quangle wangle quee but there came to the crumpety tree mr and mrs canary and they said did you ever see any spot so charmingly airy may we build a nest on your lovely hat mr quangle wangle grant us that oh please let us come and build a nest of whatever material suits you best mr quangle wangle quee and besides to the crumpety tree came the stork the duck and the owl the snail and the bumblebee the frog and the fimble fowl the fimble fowl with a corkscrew leg and all of them said we humbly beg we may build our homes on your lovely hat mr quangle wangle grant us that mr quangle wangle quee and the golden grouse came there and the pobble who has no toes and the small olympian bear and the dong with a luminous nose and the blue baboon who played the flute and the orient calf from the land of toot and the addery squash and the bisky bat all came and built on the lovely hat of the quangle wangle quee and the quangle wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree when all of these creatures move what a wonderful noise there'll be and at night by the light of the mulberry moon they danced to the flute of the blue baboon on the broad green leaves of the crumpety tree and all were happy as happy could be with the quangle wangle quee end of the quangle wangle's hat by edward lear read by heather eney A Spelling Lesson by Silas Xavier Floyd. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jacqueline Burrell Walton. The Boys and Girls of Public School, number 10, were glad to have a new girl whose name was Bertha Dent enter their spelling class. The little girl's mother told the teacher that the child could probably keep up with the first grade in spelling because she could spell such words as dog and hog and cat and rat and bat. It was not a great while before the teacher called the spelling class. She asked Bertha, the new girl, to stand with the class. You may spell dog, Mary said the teacher to one of the girls, and tell us what kind of noise little dogs make. D-O-G, dog, said Mary, and our little dog says, bow, wow, wow. That was very well done. Now, Annie, you may spell cat and tell us what kind of noise little kittens make. C-A-T, cat, replied Annie. And the little kitties sometimes say, meow, meow. And when the little doggies come round, they bristle up and hiss at the doggies. That's very well, responded the teacher. Sadie, you may spell bird and tell us what the little birds do. B-I-R-D, bird, said Sadie. We have a pretty mockingbird that sings for us all the time. 
Most birds sing, but mama says there are some birds which are good to keep bugs and worms off the vegetables and flowers. That is correct, the teacher made answer. Now, Bertha Dent, you may spell love for us and tell us what love does. Oh, said the new pupil, I know very well how to spell love. And then Bertha ran to the teacher, threw her arms around the teacher's neck, and gave her a sweet little kiss. That is the way Mama told me to spell love, said Bertha quietly, while the teacher and all the members of the spelling class smiled. That is a very pretty way to spell love, said the teacher. But don't you know any other way to spell love? Why, yes, answered Bertha, looking around. I spell love this way, too. Then she brushed a fleck of dust from the teacher's sleeve, picked up some papers that were scattered around on the platform, and arranged them on the desk. She also pulled a tiny bit of thread off the teacher's skirt. I spell love, said Bertha, by working for mama and papa and little brother and trying to make everybody happy. The teacher drew the little girl close to her side, threw one arm around the child's neck and said, that is the very best way to spell love, but can't you spell love the way the book spells it? Oh, yes, said Bertha. L-O-V-E, love. The teacher hugged Bertha, called her a dear little girl, and then dismissed the class. End of A Spelling Lesson by Silas Xavier Floyd Recording by Jacqueline Burrell Walton The Story of Mrs. Tubbs by Hugh Lofting This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, many, many years ago, there lived a very old woman, and her name was Mrs. Tubbs. She lived on a little farm, way off in the country. Her little house stood on the edge of the woods, not very far from a village, with a little church and a little river with a little bridge over it flowed close by the house. There was a barn, too, for cows and horses, only the woman hadn't any cows or horses. She lived all alone with a dog and a duck and a pig. The dog's name was Peter Punk, the duck's name was Polly Punk, and the pig's name was Patrick Pink. The old woman called them Punk, Punk, and Pink, for short. Punk and Punk had known one another for many years and were very good friends. The pig they treated as a baby because they said he was very young and hadn't much sense. The old woman did not own the farm, although she had lived on it so long. The farm belonged to a man up in London who never came there at all. This man, one fine day at the end of summer, when the leaves were beginning to fall in the woods, sent his nephew, a very silly young man with a red face, down from London to live in the farmhouse instead of Mrs. Tubbs. Punk, Punk, and Pink and the old woman were all dreadfully sad at having to leave the home where they had been so happy together for so many years. As the sun was going down behind the little church one evening at the end of summer, when the leaves were beginning to fall in the woods, they all left the farm together. Punk in front, then Pink, then Punk, and Mrs. Tubbs behind. They walked a long, long way along the edge of the woods, and at last, when they saw a seat under a tree, they all sat down to rest. Oh, dear, oh, dear, Mrs. Tubbs kept saying. Now I have no home, no place to sleep, and me, an old woman, to be turned off the farm after all these years. What shall I do? Where shall I go? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Then she stopped talking. Peter Punk and Polly Punk both understood what she said because they had lived with her so long. Pink couldn't understand because he was only a baby and he kept saying in animal language, Let's go on. I don't like this place. There's nothing to eat here. I do think it's a shame, Polly Punk said to Punk, that the old woman should be turned out. Did you see the way that stupid man slammed the door after we had gone? I'd like to see him turn me out of my house that way. 
I'd give him such a peck on his red nose he wouldn't try it again. But of course she is old, very old. I often wonder how old she really is. She's over a hundred, I know, said Punk. Yes, it's a shame she should have to go for that stupid booby. Beefsteak and onions, I call him, but it isn't altogether his fault. He's only sent here from London by his uncle who owns the farm. Well, what are we going to do with the old lady? asked Punk. She can't stay here. We will wait till she falls asleep, said Punk. Then we'll go into the woods and find a cave for her to spend the night in and cook something to eat. Isn't she asleep now? asked Punk. Her eyes are shut. No, said the dog. She's crying. Can't you feel the seat shaking? She always shuts her eyes and shakes when she cries. Presently, the old lady and the pig began to snore together. So they waked poor Pink up, and all three went into the woods. They set Pink digging truffles, and Polly Ponk went off to the river and caught a fine trout, while Punk got sticks together and made a fire. Now who's going to do the cooking? asked Punk. I'll do that, said Punk. Can you cook? asked the dog. Indeed I can, said Polly Bonk. My Aunt Deborah used to cook at a hotel, and she showed me how. You get the fire burning, and I'll soon have the fish fried. So very soon they had a nice meal ready of fried trout and truffles for the old lady. Now, said Punk, we must go into the cave and get a bed ready for Mrs. Tubbs. So they went into the cave and made a fine soft bed of leaves. What shall we do for a pillow? asked Punk. Shall we use the pig? He would be nice and soft. No, said Punk. I'm going to use him as a hot water bottle. It's very important to keep the old lady's feet warm. But I have some feathers back home which will make a fine pillow. They are some of my own which I kept last molting season. What did you do that for? asked Punk. Well, said the duck, standing first on one foot, then on the other. The fact is, I'm not getting any younger myself, and I thought if, when I'm very old... I should get bald. I could have them stuck on with glue or something. I'll fly over to the farm and fetch them. I know just where I put them. They're in the left-hand drawer of my bureau under my lavender bonnet. With a flap of her wings, she flew over the treetops to the farm and in a minute was back again with the feathers in a bag. When they had everything ready, they went and fetched Mrs. Tubbs and showed her the supper they had prepared. But the old woman would not eat anything but kept saying, Oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do? I am turned out of house and home, and me an old woman. So they put her to bed in the cave, covered her over with leaves, and placed pink at her feet as a water bottle. And presently she cried herself to sleep. Punk and Ponk now began to worry over what they should do with the old woman next. She can't stay here, said Ponk. That's certain. You see, Punk, she isn't eating anything. She is so upset, and she is so old. What we've got to do is to find some way to turn that booby out of the farm so she can go back and live there. Well, what shall we do? said the dog. I just don't know yet, Polly Ponk answered. But in the morning, before she wakes up, we must go back to the farm and see what can be done. So the next morning, while the old woman was still asleep, off they all went as the sun was getting up behind the woods. Just before they got to the farm, as they were crossing the bridge over the stream, they saw Tommy Squeak, the king of the water rats, coming down for his morning bath in the river. Catch him, said Ponk. Perhaps he'll be able to help. And they all started running as hard as they could after the water rat. Poor Tommy Squeak was dreadfully frightened at seeing a dog and a pig and a duck coming after him, and he made off for the river as fast as his legs could carry him. When he came to the river, he jumped in with a splash and disappeared. Punk and Pink sat down on the grass and said, We've lost him. But Polly Ponk, running up behind, never stopped but dived into the water, swam under the water, and just caught poor Mr. Squeak as he was popping into a hole way down at the bottom of the river. She pulled him up by his tail, carried him to the shore, and put him on the grass. Then they all gathered around him so he couldn't run away. Now, said the duck, don't be frightened. Stay where you are and do as you are told, and we won't hurt you. 
Listen, do you remember last summer when you were stealing cheese from the pantry up at the farm and you fell into a bucket of water and Mrs. Tubbs came and caught you? Do you remember? Yes, said Tommy Squeak. She let you go and told you never come back again, did she not? Yes, said Tommy Squeak. You know that she is the kindest woman to animals in all the world, don't you? Yes, said Tommy Squeak. All right, said Polly. Now listen. A red-faced booby from London Town has been sent down here to turn Mrs. Tubbs out of her house. She is terribly old, as you know. We have taken her up into the woods, but she won't eat her food. She is so sad, and we can't do anything for her. The winter is coming on, and we must get her back into the farm somehow. Now you are the king of the water rats, and this is what you must do. Call all the rats of the river together, every one of them, thousands of them and take them to the farm. Then worry the booby every way you can think of. Rattle the pans in the kitchen at night so he can't sleep. Pull the stuffing out of the chairs. Eat holes in his best hat. Do everything you can to drive him out. Then, if he goes back to London town, we can put Mrs. Tubbs back on the farm. All right, said Tommy Squeak. I'll do my best for the old woman. She certainly ought to be put back on the farm. Then he stood up on his hind legs by the river bank, and facing up the stream, he gave a long, loud, wonderful squeak. Then he turned, and facing down the stream, he gave another. And presently there was a rustling sound in the grasses all around, and a whispering sound in the bushes, and a splashing sound from the water. And everywhere rats appeared, hopping and jumping towards him, big ones and little ones, black ones, gray ones, brown ones, piebald ones, families of them, hundreds of them, thousands, millions. And they gathered round Tommy Squeak, the king rat, in a great, great big circle. Their beady black eyes looked very frightened when they saw a dog there, but they didn't run away because the king had called them. Then Tommy Squeak stood up to speak to them, and they all stopped cleaning their whiskers to listen. Rats, he said. We have a job of work to do. Follow me. And waving his paw to Punk, Punk, and Pink, he led the way to the farm. For a whole day and a night, the rats worked very hard trying to turn the man out. They rattled the pans in the kitchen at night. They pulled the stuffing out of his chair. They ate holes in his new green hat. They stopped the clock. They pulled the curtains down upon the floor. But the man sent to London town and got three wagon loads of cats and the rats were all driven back to the river. Tommy Squeak came to Punk, Pink, and Ponk on the second day and said, I am sorry. We did our best, but we couldn't move him. So Ponk said to Punk, Well, we must try something else. And they left the old woman in the woods and started off again. As they were crossing the river this time, before they got to the farm, they saw Tilly Twitter, the queen of the swallows, sitting on the corner of the bridge. Good morning, said Tilly. You look very sad. Oh, Tilly, said Punk with tears in his eyes. Mrs. Tubbs has been turned out of house and home. Oh, gracious, cried Tilly. You don't say. Who turned her out? A man from London, said Punk. I call him Beefsteak and Onions. Do you think you can do anything to help us get her back to the farm? Certainly, I'll do my best said Tilly, pushing her crown further back on her head. I have built my nest over the old woman's door for three springs now. I would hate to have her leave the farm for good. I'll see what I can do. Then she flew up into the air, going round and round in circles. Higher and higher she flew, and all the time she sang a beautiful song at the top of her voice. And this is the song she sang. The leaves are falling in the woods. Go get your traveling rugs and hoods. The summer's gone, the snow'll soon be here. It's time to fly, but we'll come back next year. Now every year when all the swallows heard Tilly Twitter sing this song, they knew it was time for them to get together to fly to Africa because they don't like the winter's cold in England. So now when they heard it, they got their children together and snatching up their bags and bundles, they all flew towards Mrs. Tubbs' farm. So many of them came that the sky grew dark, and people thought the night was come, 
and the farm boys and the country around stopped their plow horses and said, There goes the swallows, getting ready to fly to Africa. The frost will soon be here. For five hours they kept coming, more and more and more of them. They gathered round Tilly, sitting on house, on the barn and the railings, on the gates, on the bridge and on the stones, but never on the trees. Swallows never sit on trees. So many of them came that the whole land seemed covered with the blue of their wings and the white of their breasts. And when they had all arrived, Tilly got up and spoke. Swallows, she said, many years ago, when I first built my mud nest under the eaves of this farm, I had five children in my nest. They were my first family, and I was very proud of them. That was before I became queen of the swallows. And being a very inexperienced mother, I built the nest too small. When my children grew up, there was not proper room for them. Philip, a very strong child, was always twisting and turning in the nest, and one day he fell out. He bumped his nose badly on the ground, but it was not far to fall, and he was not much hurt. I was just going to fly down and try to pick him up when I saw a large weasel coming across the farmyard to get him. My feathers stood up on the top of my head with fright. I flew to the farmhouse window and beat upon the glass with my wings. An old woman came out. When she saw Philip on the ground and the weasel coming to get him, she threw her parge spoon at the weasel, picked Philip up, and put him back in my nest. That old woman's name was Mrs. Tubbs. She has now been turned out of her house, and a very stupid, red-faced man is living on the farm in her place. We have got to do our best to turn him out and put Mrs. Tubbs back in her house, the same as she put my child back in his nest. So I have called you all together a week earlier than usual this year for our long journey to Africa. And before we leave England, we have got to see what we can do. The first thing we'll do is to stop up his chimney so his fire won't burn. Then put his mud all over the windows so the light will not come in. Bring all the straw from the barn and fill his bedroom with it. Take his best necktie and drop it in the river. And do everything we can to drive him out. So the swallows set to work, and Punk, Punk, and Pink went back to the old woman in the woods. But after two days, Tilly came to them and said, I am very sorry, but I have not succeeded. The cats have driven my swallows away. He has a thousand cats in the place. What can one do? So Punk said to Punk, We must go out and try something else. But Polly Punk answered, No, you go alone this time. The old woman is getting cold, and I must stay and look after her. So Peter Punk went off with his tail dragging on the ground. He hung about the farm and was very sad and wondered what he could do to drive beefsteak and onion out of the house. Presently, feeling hungry, he remembered he had hidden a ham bone in the trunk of a tree behind the house some weeks ago, and he went off to see if it was still there. When he got to the tree, he stood up on his hind legs and looked into the hole. A wasp flew out and stung him on the nose. He sat down on the grass and watched the tree for a minute and saw many wasps coming in and going out through the hole. Then he understood what had happened. Thousands of wasps had made a nest in the hollow tree. So he thought of a plan. He went and got a big stick and threw it into the hole in the tree. Then all the wasps came flying out and tried to sting him. He went running towards the house with the wasps after him and ran in through the back door of the house. The wasps kept following him, though a few stopped to sting some of the cats that were hanging about the back door. Then he ran up the stairs by the front staircase, into the bedrooms, and down by the back stairs. In the hall he found Beefsteak and Onions, who had just come in from digging potatoes, with a spade in his hand. Punk ran between his legs and out through the front door. When the wasps could not find Punk any more, they thought the man had hidden him somewhere, so they set upon him and stung him, and the rest of them stung all the cats they could find in the house and drove them away across the fields. Poor Beefsteak and Onion ran out into the yard and shut himself up in the barn to get away from the wasps. Then he laid down his spade and put on his coat and said, 
I'll leave this house today. My uncle can come and live here himself if he wants to. But I'm going back to London town. I didn't want to turn the old lady out anyway. I do not believe my uncle knew anyone was living here at all. I'm going today. Punk was listening outside the door and heard him, so he ran off at once back to the woods. When he got to Punk and Pink, he started dancing on his hind legs. What's the matter? asked Punk. Have you gone crazy? But all he answered was, Hurrah, hurrah, he's going away. Old beefsteak and onions is going today. Then he told them how he had at last succeeded, and they both thought he was a very clever dog. It was now getting late in the evening, so they went and got Mrs. Tubbs, and they all walked back to the farm by moonlight. And the old woman was so happy to get back to her little house that she made them all a very fine supper. And Pink said, I'm glad to get back. There is something to eat here. And so, when the leaves were all fallen in the woods, and the trees stood bare waiting for the snow, they used to sit round the warm fire in the evenings, toasting chestnuts and telling stories while the kettle steamed upon the hob and the wind howled in the chimney above. And they never had to leave the farm again, and they all lived happily ever after. End of the Story of Mrs. Tubbs by Hugh Lofting Read by Ruth Maston. Story of Sisyphus by Flora J. Cook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little White Cloud was the ocean's daughter. The ocean loved her and wished always to keep her near him. One day, when her father was asleep, White Cloud went out to walk alone. The sun saw her and said, Come, White Cloud, I am your king. I will give you a ride upon my bright rays. White Cloud had often longed for this very thing, so she went gladly and soon found herself among the fleecy clouds in the sky. When the ocean awoke, he called his little daughter. She did not answer. He called again and again, louder and still louder, until the people said, Listen, it's thundering. But the ocean only heard the echo of his own voice from the shore. He rushed high up on the beach and moaned aloud. He ran into all the caves, but White Cloud could not be found. Everyone had loved White Cloud. So by this time, all of the water was white with the crests of the weeping sea nymphs. A great giant was sitting upon the shore near the sea. His name was Sisyphus. He felt sorry for the ocean and said, Listen, friend ocean, I often watch you carrying the great ships and wish that I, too, had great work to do. You see how dry it is on the mountain. Few people come this way. You are not even now as lonely as I, yet I want to help you. Promise me that you will put a spring upon this mountainside where all the tired and thirsty people may drink, and I'll tell you where White Cloud is. The ocean said, I cannot put a spring upon the mountain, but if you will follow my son River, he will take you to a spring where he was born. The giant told the ocean how the sun ran away with White Cloud. The sun heard him and was angry. He placed Sisyphus in the sea, saying, You are far too strong to sit idly upon the shore. You say you want a great work to do. You shall have it. You shall forever use your strength to push these stones upon the shore, and they shall forever roll back upon you. The giant began his work at once and was worked faithfully every day since that time. Many people do not yet know what his work is. Do you? Do you know what Sisyphus is making? End of Story of Sisyphus by Flora J. Cook The Story of the Pudding Stone by Flora J. Cook this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, a family of giants lived upon the high mountain in the west. One day, the mother giant was called away from home. She arose early in the morning and made ready the bread and butter for the little giants to eat while she was gone. When she had finished her work, it was not yet time to start upon her journey. She said to herself, My children are the best children in the world, and they shall have a treat. I have many plums left from the Christmas feast, and I will make a plum pudding for a surprise. The good woman brought together the plums, which it had taken her many days to prepare with the help of all of her children. Indeed, she had emptied several mountain lakes to get enough water to wash them all. She now mixed these wonderful plums into a pudding and put it into an oven to bake. The mixing took so long that she had to hurry. She had quite forgot she said anything about the pudding to the little giants. She had intended to tell them about it just before she left them. It was afternoon when the giant children found the pudding. It was badly burned upon the top by that time. They had already eaten the bread and the butter and were not hungry. One little giant said to the others, Let us make balls of the pudding and see who could throw it the farthest. You know that giants are very strong. And away went the pudding up into the air. The little giants made little balls, and the older giants threw pieces as big as a house. Many pieces went over the mountains and fell down into the valley beyond. Indeed, this wonderful pudding was scattered for miles over the whole land. For the giants did not stop throwing as long as there was any pudding left in the pan. When the sun had shone upon it many days and dried and hardened it, people called it pudding stone. You may find it today thrown all over the land, full of the plums which the good woman washed with the waters of many lakes. End of The Story of the Pudding Stone by Flora J. Cook The Tale of Benjamin Bunny by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One morning, a little rabbit sat on a bank. He pricked his ears and listened to the trit-trot, trit-trot of a pony. A gig was coming along the road. It was driven by Mr. McGregor, and beside him sat Mrs. McGregor in her best bonnet. As soon as they had passed, little Benjamin Bunny slid down into the road and set off with a hop, skip, and a jump to call upon his relations, who lived in the wood at the back of Mr. McGregor's garden. That wood was full of rabbit holes, and in the neatest, sandiest hole of all lived Benjamin's aunt and his cousins, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Old Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool, mittens, and muffets. I once bought a pair at a bazaar. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which is what we call lavender. Little Benjamin did not very much want to see his aunt. He came round the back of the fir tree and nearly tumbled upon the top of his cousin Peter. Peter was sitting by himself. He looked poorly and was dressed in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Peter, said little Benjamin in a whisper. Who has got your clothes? Peter replied. The scarecrow in Mr. McGregor's garden and described how he had been chased about the garden and had dropped his shoes and coat. Little Benjamin sat down beside his cousin and assured him that Mr. McGregor had gone out in a gig and Mrs. McGregor also, and certainly for the day, because she was wearing her best bonnet. Peter said he hoped that it would rain. At this point, old Mrs. Rabbit's voice was heard inside the rabbit hole, calling, Cottontail, Cottontail, fetch some more chamomile. Peter said he thought he might feel better if he went for a walk. They went away hand in hand and got upon the flat top of the wall at the bottom of the wood. From here they looked down into Mr. McGregor's garden. Peter's coat and shoes were plainly to be seen upon the scarecrow, topped with an old tam-o'-shanter of Mr. McGregor's. 
Little Benjamin said, It spoils people's clothes to squeeze under a gate. The proper way to get in is to climb down a pear tree. Peter fell down head first, but it was of no consequence as the bed below was newly raked and quite soft. It had been sewn in lettuces. They left a great many odd little footmarks all over the bed, especially little Benjamin, who was wearing clogs. Little Benjamin said that the first thing to be done was to get back Peter's clothes in order that they might be able to use a pocket handkerchief. They took them off the scarecrow. There had been rain during the night. There was water in the shoes, and the coat was somewhat shrunk. Benjamin tried on the tam o' shanter, but it was too big for him. Then he suggested that they should fill the pocket handkerchief with onions as a little present for his aunt. Peter did not seem to be enjoying himself. He kept hearing noises. Benjamin, on the contrary, was perfectly at home and ate a lettuce leaf. He said that he was in the habit of coming to the garden with his father to get lettuces for their Sunday dinner. The name of little Benjamin's papa was old Mr. Benjamin Bunny. The lettuces certainly were very fine. Peter did not eat anything. He said he should like to go home. Presently, he dropped half the onions. Little Benjamin said that it was not possible to get back up the pear tree with a load of vegetables. He led the way boldly towards the other end of the garden. They went along a little walk on planks under a sunny red brick wall. The mice sat on their doorsteps, cracking cherry stones. They winked at Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin Bunny. Presently, Peter let the pocket handkerchief go again. They go amongst flower pots and frames and tubs. Peter heard noises worse than ever. His eyes were as big as lollipops. He was a step or two in front of his cousin when he suddenly stopped. This is what those little rabbits saw around that corner. Little Benjamin took one look and then in half a minute, less than no time, he hid himself and Peter and the onions underneath a large basket. The cat got up and stretched herself and came and sniffed at the basket. Perhaps she liked the smell of onions. Anyway, she sat down upon the top of the basket. She sat there for five hours. I cannot draw you a picture of Peter and Benjamin underneath the basket because it was quite dark and because the smell of onions was fearful. It made Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin cry. The sun got round behind the wood and it was quite late in the afternoon, but still the cat sat upon the basket. At length, there was a pitter-patter, pitter-patter, and some bits of mortar fell from the wall above. The cat looked up and saw old Mr. Benjamin Bunny prancing along the top of the wall of the upper terrace. He was smoking a pipe of rabbit tobacco and had a little switch in his hand. He was looking for his son. Old Mr. Bunny had no opinion whatever of cats. He took a tremendous jump off the top of the wall onto the top of the cat and cuffed it off the basket and kicked it into the greenhouse, scratching off a handful of fur. The cat was too much surprised to scratch back. When old Mr. Bunny had driven the cat into the greenhouse, he locked the door. Then he came back to the basket and took out his son, Benjamin, by the ears and whipped him with the little switch. Then he took out his nephew, Peter. Then he took out the handkerchief of onions and marched out of the garden. When Mr. McGregor returned about half an hour later, he observed several things which perplexed him. It looked as though some person had been walking all over the garden in a pair of clogs. Only the footmarks were too ridiculously little. Also, he could not understand how the cat could have managed to shut herself up inside the greenhouse, locking the door upon the outside. When Peter got home, his mother forgave him because she was so glad to see that he had found his shoes and coat. 
Cottontail and Peter folded up the pocket handkerchief, and old Mrs. Rabbit strung up the onions and hung them from the kitchen ceiling with the bunches of herbs and the rabbit tobacco. The End End of The Tale of Benjamin Bunny by Beatrix Potter The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sand bank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now run along and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella and went through the wood to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane together to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First, he ate some lettuces and some French beans. And then, he ate some radishes. And then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop, thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one shoe among the cabbages and the other amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he had not unfortunately run into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for loss and shed big tears but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop on the top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time. Leaving his jacket behind him, he rushed into the tool shed and jumped into a can it would have been a beautiful thing to hide in if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently, Peter sneezed, hers, shoo! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time and tried to put his foot upon Peter who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea which way to go. Also, he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time, he began to wander about, going lipty lipty, not very fast and looking all around. He found a door in a wall but it was locked and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family. In the wood, Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently, he came to a pond where Mr. McGregor filled his water cans. A white cat 
was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still, but now and then the tip of her tail twitched as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a ho, screech, scratch, scratch, screech. Peter scuttered underneath the bushes, but presently, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could go along a straight walk behind some black currant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner, but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him, till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea. And she gave a dose of it to Peter, one teaspoonful to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. End of The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Every afternoon, as they were coming from school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden. It was a large, lovely garden with soft green grass. Here and there over the grass stood beautiful flowers like stars, and there were twelve peach trees that in the springtime broke out into delicate blossoms of pink and pearl, and in the autumn bore rich fruit. The birds sat on the trees and sang so sweetly that the children used to stop their games in order to listen to them. How happy we are here, they cried to each other. One day the giant came back. He had been to visit his friend, the Cornish Ogre, and had stayed with him for seven years. After the seven years were over, he had said all that he had to say, for his conversation was limited, and he determined to return to his own castle. When he arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? He cried in a very gruffy voice, and the children ran away. My own garden is my own garden, said the giant. Anyone can understand that, and I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. So he built a high wall all around it and put up a notice board. Trespassers will be prosecuted. He was a very selfish giant. The poor children had now nowhere to play. They tried to play on the road, but the road was very dusty and full of hard stones and they did not like it. They used to wander round the high wall when their lessons were over and talk about the beautiful garden inside. How happy we were there, they said to each other. Then the spring came, and all over the country there were little blossoms and little birds. Only in the garden of the selfish giant it was still winter. The birds did not care to sing in it, as there were no children, and the trees forgot to blossom. Once, a beautiful flower put its head out from the grass, but when it saw the notice board, it was so sorry for the children that it slipped back into the ground again 
and went off to sleep. The only people who were pleased were the snow and the frost. Spring has forgotten this garden, they cried. So we will live here all the year round. The snow covered up the grass with her great white cloak, and the frost painted all the trees silver. Then they invited the north wind to stay with them, and he came. He was wrapped in furs, and he roared all day about the garden, and blew the chimney pots down. This is a delightful spot, he said. We must ask the hail on a visit. So the hail came. Every day for three hours he rattled on the roof of the castle till he broke most of the slates, and then he ran round and round the garden as fast as he could go. He was dressed in grey, and his breath was like ice. I cannot understand why the spring is so late in coming, said the selfish giant as he sat at the window and looked out at his cold white garden. I hope there will be a change in the weather. But the spring never came, nor the summer. The autumn gave golden fruit to every garden, but to the giant's garden she gave none. He is too selfish, she said. So it was always winter there, and the north wind, and the hail, and the frost, and the snow danced about through the trees. One morning, the giant was lying awake in bed, when he heard some lovely music. It sounded so sweet to his ears that he thought it must be the king's musicians passing by. It was really only a little linnet singing outside his window, but it was so long since he had heard a bird sing in his garden that it seemed to him to be the most beautiful music in the world. Then the hail stopped dancing over his head, and the north wind ceased roaring, and a delicious perfume came to him through the open casement. I believe the spring has come at last, said the giant, and he jumped out of bed and looked out. What did he see? He saw a most wonderful sight. Through a little hole in the wall, the children had crept in and they were sitting in the branches of the trees. In every tree that he could see, there was a little child. And the trees were so glad to have the children back again that they had covered themselves with blossoms and were waving their arms gently above the children's heads. The birds were flying about and twittering with delight, and the flowers were looking up through the green grass and laughing. It was a lovely scene, only in one corner it was still winter. It was the farthest corner of the garden, and in it was standing a little boy. He was so small that he could not reach up to the branches of the tree, and he was wandering all around it, crying bitterly. The poor tree was still quite covered with frost and snow, and the north wind was blowing and roaring above it. Climb up, little boy, said the tree, and it bent its branches down as low as it could, but the boy was too tiny. And the giant's heart melted as he looked out. How selfish I have been, he said. Now I know why the spring would not come here. I will put that poor little boy on the top of the tree, and then I will knock down the wall and my garden shall be the children's playground forever and ever. He was really very sorry for what he had done. So he crept downstairs and opened the front door quite softly and went out into the garden. But when the children saw him, they were so frightened that they all ran away, and the garden became winter again. Only the little boy did not run, for his eyes were so full of tears that he did not see the giant coming. And the giant stole up behind him and took him gently in his hand and put him up into the tree. And the tree broke at once into blossom, and the birds came and sang on it, and the little boy stretched out his two arms and flung them around the giant's neck and kissed him. And the other children when they saw that the giant was not wicked any longer, 
came running back, and with them came the spring. It is your garden now, little children, said the giant. And he took a great axe and knocked down the wall. And when the people were going to market at twelve o'clock, they found the giant playing with the children in the most beautiful garden they had ever seen. All day long they played, and in the evening they came to the giant to bid him goodbye. But where is your little companion? he said. The boy I put into the tree. The giant loved him the best because he had kissed him. We don't know, answered the children. He has gone away. You must tell him to be sure and come here tomorrow, said the giant. But the children said that they did not know where he lived. He had never seen him before, and the giant felt very sad. Every afternoon when school was over, the children came and played with the giant. But the little boy whom the giant loved was never seen again. The giant was very kind to all the children, yet he longed for his first little friend and often spoke of him. How I would like to see him, he used to say. Years went over and the giant grew very old and feeble. He could not play about any more, so he sat in a huge armchair and watched the children at their game and admired his garden. I have many beautiful flowers, he said, but the children are the most beautiful flowers of all. One winter morning, he looked out of his window as he was dressing. He did not hate the winter now, for he knew that it was merely the spring asleep and that the flowers were resting. Suddenly, he rubbed his eyes in wonder and looked and looked. It certainly was a marvelous sight. In the farthest corner of the garden was a tree quite covered with lovely white blossoms. Its branches were all golden and silver fruit hung down from them, and underneath it stood the little boy he had loved. Downstairs ran the giant in great joy and out into the garden. He hastened across the grass and came near to the child. And when he came quite close, his face grew red with anger, and he said, Who had dared to wound thee? For on the palms of the child's hands were the prints of two nails, and the prints of two nails were on the little feet. Who hath dared to wound thee? cried the giant. Tell me that I may take my big sword and slay him. Nay, answered the child, but these are the wounds of love. Who art thou? said the giant, and a strange awe fell on him, and he knelt before the child. And the child smiled on the giant and said to him, You let me play once in your garden. Today you shall come with me to my garden which is paradise. And when the children ran in that afternoon, they found the giant lying dead under the tree, all covered with white blossoms. End of The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde The Whistle by James Baldwin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Two hundred years ago, there lived in Boston a little boy whose name was Benjamin Franklin. On the day that he was seven years old, his mother gave him a few pennies. He looked at the bright yellow pieces and said, What shall I do with these coppers, mother? It was the first money he had ever had. You may buy something if you wish, said his mother. And then will you give me more? he asked. His mother shook her head and said, No, Benjamin, I cannot give you any more, so you must be careful not to spend these foolishly. The little fellow ran into the street. He heard the pennies jingle in his pocket. How rich he was! Boston is now a great city, but at that time it was only a little town. 
there were not many stores. As Benjamin ran down the street, he wondered what he should buy. Should he buy candy? He hardly knew how it tasted. Should he buy a pretty toy? If he had been the only child in the family, things might have been different. But there were 14 boys and girls older than he, and two little sisters who were younger. What a big family it was, and the father was a poor man. No wonder the lad had never owned a toy. He had not gone far when he met a larger boy who was blowing a whistle. I wish I had that whistle, he said. The big boy looked at him and blew it again. Oh, what a pretty sound it made. I have some pennies, said Benjamin. He held them in his hand and showed them to the boy. You may have them if you will give me the whistle. All of them? Yes, all of them. Well, it's a bargain, said the boy, and he gave the whistle to Benjamin and took the pennies. Little Benjamin Franklin was very happy, for he was only seven years old. He ran home as fast as he could, blowing the whistle as he ran. See, mother, he said, I have bought a whistle. How much did you pay for it? All the pennies you gave me? Oh, Benjamin, one of his brothers asked to see the whistle. Well, well, he said, you've paid a dear price for this thing. It's only a penny whistle and a poor one at that. You might have bought half a dozen such whistles with the money I gave you, said his mother. The little boy saw what a mistake he had made. The whistle did not please him any more. He threw it upon the floor and began to cry. Never mind, my child, said his mother very kindly. You are only a very little boy and you will learn a great deal as you grow bigger. The lesson you have learned today is never to pay too dear for a whistle. Benjamin Franklin lived to be a very old man, but he never forgot that lesson. Every boy and girl should remember the name of Benjamin Franklin. He was a great thinker and a great doer, and with Washington he helped to make our country free. His life was such that no man could ever say, Ben Franklin has wronged me. End of The Whistle by James Baldwin Read by Jacqueline Burrell Walton Willie Mouse by Alta Tabor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Willie Mouse had often heard his ma and pa say that the moon was made of green cheese, and one evening he thought he would see if he could find it. He packed up a piece of green cheese and a crust of bread, and, taking his lantern, set out on his travels. He had not gone far when he met his friend Mr. Woodmouse, who asked him where he was going. Oh, said Willie, I'm going to find the moon. It's made of green cheese, you know. I don't believe it's made of green cheese at all, said Mr. Woodmouse, but Willie wouldn't listen to him and went on his way. Coming round by Clover Green, whom should he meet but Miss Jenny Wren, looking very gay in her yellow bonnet. Where are you off to? she asked. I'm on my way to find the moon. The moon, cried Miss Wren. You'll never reach it. I flew ever so high one evening, and I didn't seem to get any nearer. Well, said Willie, why should it be made of green cheese if you can't reach it? And on he went. Presently he came up to a wood, and looking up he saw Mr. Squirrel jumping from branch to branch. Good afternoon, he said. You do seem high up. Surely you can tell me the way to the moon. It's made of green cheese, you know. I don't think it's made of green cheese. Why shouldn't it be made of nuts? How ignorant everybody is, said Willie Mouse to himself. So on he went once more until he came to a little hole in the ground, and being very curious, he peeped inside. There sat Mrs. Mole, who came out when she saw him. Do you live down there? asked Willie politely. Yes, replied Mrs. Mole. Then I'm afraid you can't tell me how to get to the moon. It's made of green cheese, you know. Ma says so. Nonsense, my child. Don't waste your time looking for the moon. Keep your eyes open for worms. Willie said goodbye to Mrs. Mole. Then he sat down and opened his parcel because it was getting late, and he thought he had better have some dinner. I may not reach the moon yet a while, he thought so I had better save a little piece of cheese for supper. After dinner he fell asleep, and on waking he found that it was quite dark. He looked up, and there was the moon right high up in the sky. Oh, Mr. Moon, he cried, you do seem a long way away. I think it would be much easier for you to come down here than for me to get up there. 
but Mr. Moon stayed where he was. Looking up, Willy Mouse saw two big eyes gleaming in the dark. They belonged to Mrs. Owl, and as Willy was only a little mouse, he didn't know that Mrs. Owl had a special liking for little mice. Please, Mrs. Owl, said he, how can I get to the moon? Down flew Mrs. Owl. This is the way to the moon, she said, and she caught him up in her beak and carried him back to the owl house where she lived. When Willy Mouse saw all the owlets with their beaks gaping open, he began to be frightened, for he feared that Mrs. Owl was going to eat him all up. But he didn't know that a good green elf who lived in the trunk of the tree was near at hand, and just as Mrs. Owl opened her beak, the leaves rustled, and there stood Mr. Elf, who jumped to the ground with Willy on his back. When the good green elf had shown him the way home, he thought he would ask if the moon were really made of green cheese. But all of a sudden, Mr. Elf disappeared, and Willy Mouse still thinks that one day he will find the moon and have enough cheese to last him all his life. But he will wait until he is a little older and bigger before he tries to jump to the moon. And perhaps by that time, he may be wiser too. End of Willy Mouse by Alta Tabor. Read by Heather Eney. The Wise King and the Bee by Flora J. Cook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Long ago there lived in the East the greatest king in the world. It was believed that no one could ask him a question which he could not answer. Wise men came from far and near, but they were never able to puzzle King Solomon. He knew all the trees and plants. He understood the beasts, fowls, and creeping things almost as well as he did people. The fame of his knowledge spread into all lands. In the south, the great queen of Sheba heard of the wonderful wisdom of Solomon and said, I shall test his power for myself. She picked some clover blossoms from the field and bade a great artist make for her, in wax, flowers, buds, and leaves exactly like them. She was much pleased when they were finished, for she herself could see no difference in the two bunches. She carried them to the king and said, Choose, O wise king, which are the real flowers? At first King Solomon was puzzled, but soon he saw a bee buzzing at the window. Ha! Ah, said he, here is one come to help me in my choice. Throw open the window for my friend. The Queen of Sheba bowed her head and said, You are indeed a wise king, but I begin to understand your wisdom. I thank you for this lesson. End of The Wise King and the Bee by Flora J. Cook Read by Atello Writing a Composition by James Baldwin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children, tomorrow I shall expect all of you to write compositions, said the teacher of Love Lane School. Then on Friday, those of you who have done the best may stand up and read their compositions to the school. Some of the children were pleased, and some were not. What shall we write about? they asked. You may choose any subject that you like best, said the teacher. Some of them thought that home was a good subject. Others liked school. One little boy chose the horse. A little girl said she would write about summer. The next day, every pupil except one had written a composition. Henry Longfellow, said the teacher. Why have you not written? Because I don't know how, answered Henry. He was only a child. Well, said the teacher, you can write words, can you not? Yes, sir, said the boy. After you have written three or four words, you can put them together, can you not? Yes, sir, I think so. Well then, said the teacher, you may take your slate and go out behind the schoolhouse for half an hour. Think of something to write about and write the word on your slate. Then try to tell what it is, what it is like, what it is good for, and what is done with it. 
That is the way to write a composition. Henry took his slate and went out. Just behind the schoolhouse was Mr. Finney's barn. Quite close to the barn was a garden, and in the garden, Henry saw a turnip. Well, I know what that is, he said to himself, and he wrote the word turnip on his slate. Then he tried to tell what it was like, what it was good for, and what was done with it. Before the half hour was ended, he had written a very neat composition on his slate. He then went into the house and waited while the teacher read it. The teacher was surprised and pleased. He said, Henry Longfellow, you have done very well. Today you may stand up before the school and read what you have written about the turnip. Many years after that, some funny little verses about Mr. Finney's turnip were printed in a newspaper. Some people said that they were what Henry Longfellow wrote on his slate that day at school. But this was not true. Henry's composition was not in verse. As soon as it was read to the school, he rubbed it off the slate and it was forgotten. Perhaps you would like to read those funny verses. Here they are, but you must never, never, never think that Henry Longfellow wrote them. Mr. Finney had a turnip, and it grew and it grew. It grew behind the barn, and the turnip did no harm. And it grew and it grew till it could grow no taller. Then Mr. Finney took it up and put it in the cellar. There it lay, there it lay, till it began to rot. Then Susie Finney washed it and put it in a pot. She boiled it and boiled it as long as she was able. Then Mrs. Finney took it and put it on the table. Mr. Finney and his wife both sat down to sup. And they ate and they ate. They ate the turnip up. All the school children in our country have heard of Henry W. Longfellow. He was the best loved of all our poets. He wrote The Village Blacksmith, The Children's Hour, and many other beautiful pieces which you will like to read and remember. End of Writing a Composition by James Baldwin Read by Jacqueline Burrell Walton